I see there is a relationship, it may not seem uh, logical to everybody, between eliminating our general admission fee and experimenting in how we present art. And the connection for both is actually the first line of our mission statement, which I'm very fond of. It says we bring art and people together for enjoyment, discovery, and learning. And by the color of the walls, by the accompanying music, by the lighting, we were exploring what discovery, enjoyment, and learning within this show is all about. Typically what one finds in an installation dealing with a 19th century French painter long dead are a lot of words, text panels, or audio tours, for example. But what we decided to do was something a little different. We took away the crutch of words and instead tried to induce a meditative state that would facilitate prolonged looking. So by using music and lighting effects, what we've hoped to do is to induce a state of almost zen-like calm so that you're ready to receive the paintings and allow the paintings to work their magic. The uh, concept behind the lighting design was to create an environment where the eye could more naturally interact with paintings. To do this, um, we chose to use natural cycles of fading in the lights, similar to what you would experience in an outdoor environment. They operate at an almost subliminal level, but are keyed to the way the eye responds to the presence of light, relaxing it and allowing the detail and subtlety and nuance of color in the paintings to become much more perceptible. We worked with Paul Deeb, lighting designer, to choose the wall colors that worked with his lighting effects that he had for each room in the galleries. For instance, the light in winter was very dark and very tight around each painting, which made it feel cold with the paint color, which was blue and then really brought out the, the whites really stood out in the paintings and it really created this kind of cold atmosphere versus spring which had a very high light level and we had yellow paint which really brought out this glowing kind of warm feeling um, in spring. So the lighting and the paint working together really kind of made you look at the paintings in a different way and I think it really worked. My name is Amy Kirsten, I'm a composer from Peabody, and when I was first approached about this project I was really excited uh, because of the opportunity to work with art again. Um, some of my previous compositions have been inspired by artwork, and so when I did research on Courbet I found some of his landscapes and I was immediately struck by how much sound there was in the paintings. When thinking about uh, the process of of working on this piece and what kind of instrumentation I was going to use, I immediately thought of voice and percussion because in my research on Courbet, I found that he used a palette knife and sometimes even his fingers to make some of these paintings and I thought it was very interesting and um, somewhat um, intimate and sensual and kind of um, drew me to think about um, human instinct. And so I started to think about the human instinct of making music and how it all started. And so voice and percussion were um, some of the first known um, ways to make music. And so that's how I came to write using this instrumentation.
One of the greatest assets of the Walters Art Museum is the fact that we have a very well-known, highly regarded, and extremely complete conservation division with multiple paintings conservators and multiple objects conservators. And in the case of Corbe, that's particularly advantageous because there have always been questions about attribution when it comes to the late landscapes of Gustave Courbe. So the thing that we decided to do here at the Walters is add a component to the temporary exhibition that we received from the Getty, Courbet in the Modern Landscape, through a focus show. And here we're standing in a gallery devoted to the focus show Courbet, not Courbet. This was a means of getting visitors to grapple with the problem of attribution head on. We've assembled here a selection of 12 paintings from local institutions and from private collectors. And some of them are actually authentic, and some of them are dubious, and some of them are outright forgeries. But because we have at the Walters a distinguished conservation division, we were able to take advantage of the expertise of our paintings conservator, Eric Gordon, um, in didactics included in the focus show and how one could perhaps distinguish between the unique gesture of Gustave Courbet versus the brushwork associated with his followers and emulators. This painting had never been treated before it was recently treated for this exhibition. And it was very exciting removing the discolored varnish because what we could see underneath was a painting technique different from almost any other painting technique on a 19th century picture in the Walters collection. After looking at all the paintings in this gallery, we asked that people look specifically at one painting and use the skills that they've acquired throughout this exhibition and try to figure out whether this one painting is by Courbet or not Courbet. We asked that they look at this painting and then record their answer, and the most persuasive answer will win a poster, a framed Courbet poster from the museum. And by doing this, we really are hoping to bring art and people together for enjoyment, discovery, and learning, which is our mission here at the museum. I see this Corbet installation right now as a kind of flagship for what will be uh, an increasingly identifiable center for research in the art experience at the Walters, bringing together the entire staff uh, into this conversation, into this exploration about what the experience is about, taking experiments to test what we learn. It means making, making the best good estimates of outcome before we start having, working with people that can can measure things, uh, this is going to be part of our future. And I think this show is a perfect launching pad for that.